In the year 1891, the public was shocked to read my account of the death of my good friend and associate, Sherlock Holmes, who was thought to have plunged to an icy grave over the Reichenbach Falls in the iron embrace of his arch foe, Professor Moriarty. However, as my readers are now doubtless aware, Holmes was not dead but rather wandering about Central Europe, the Middle East, and part of Asia for three years. At the time of his return, we gave it out that he was in flight from the professor's avenging minions. I can at last tell you that this was untrue. I have kept the secret of Holmes' disappearance for nearly half a century for discretion's sake. I am now prepared to lay before the public the true facts as I know them, in a history I have labelled privately, The Adventure of the 7% Solution. Simon Callow as Sherlock Holmes, Ian Hogg as Dr. Watson, and Carl Johnson as Sigmund Freud in The 7% Solution. Adapted by Danny Martin Flynn from the novel by Nicholas Meyer. It was on April the 24th that I heard for the first time in months from Sherlock Holmes. My marriage and my subsequent start in private practice had effected a radical alteration in the pattern of my relations with my friend. On this particular day, a telegram had been delivered to my surgery, not from Holmes, but from his landlady, Mrs. Hudson, imploring me to return to my former rooms without delay. I hailed a cab, set out for my former lodgings and rang the bell of 221 Lee Baker Street. Oh, Dr. Watson, thank heaven you've come. I'm at my wit's end. Why? What has happened? These last few months since you've left us, he's become very strange. He's got himself barricaded in up there, won't take his meals, keeps the shutters closed all day, and then steals out at night. Dr. Watson, I think he's taking... Mrs. Hudson! Mrs. Hudson, I hear someone down there with you. I heard the cab stop before the door. If that gentleman answers to the name Moriarty, you may show him up and I will deal with him. I'd better go to him. Be careful. I mounted the 17 well-trod steps with a heavy heart. What a noble mind was here overthrown. Moriarty, is that you? It is I, Watson. Watson? You see, it is I, Holmes. Let me enter. Not so fast. You may be Moriarty in disguise. Prove you are Watson. Oh, how on earth am I to do that? Tell me where I keep my tobacco. I in the toe of your Persian slipper. Now, would you... Oh, my correspondence? ...is affixed to the mantle with a jackknife. Now, let and me... And what were the first words I ever spoke to you? Y you have been in Afghanistan, I perceive. For heaven's sake, Holmes. Very well. I am satisfied. Forgive me for doubting you, my dear fellow, but I had to be certain... I was astonished by his appearance. His skin had a positively unhealthy pallor. My dear doctor, I owe you an explanation. I have no doubt you find this all very bizarre. I assure you my plight is quite genuine. What is it? Have you ever heard of Professor Moriarty? The name was one I had only known him to mutter when in the thrall of one of his cocaine injections. Never. Aye, there's the genius and the wonder of the thing. The man pervades London, the Western world even, and no one has ever heard of him. The man is my nemesis, Watson. My evil genius. Tea? Huh? Oh, uh, thank you. How have you been otherwise, Holmes? Never better. It's almost spring. Have you noticed? With all this rain and fog, you'd never think it. Well, I... Uh... For years past, Watson, I've been continually conscious of some deep organizing power which guides and inspires crimes of the most varying sorts. Here you are. Ah, oh, thank you. Yes, it is a wet spring. I, I was saying only yesterday to Mary... He is the Napoleon of crime, Watson. He is the organizer of half that is evil and nearly all that is undetected in this great city and in the annals of contemporary crime. He's a genius, a philosopher, an abstract thinker. He sits motionless like a spider in the center of his web. But that web has a thousand radiations and he knows well each quiver of them. His agents may be caught and their crimes forestalled, but he, he is never so much as suspected. Until now, that is. Until I, his arch-enemy, managed to deduce his existence and penetrate his perimeters. And now his henchmen, having discovered my success, are on my track. Well, Holmes, what do you propose to do? Do? 
Why, for the moment, I think I shall nap. He flung himself absent-mindedly into a chair and fell into a deep and troubled sleep. As I watched him, an awful thought struck me. I pulled back his lids and examined his pupils. They were dilated. I then took his pulse. It was weak and unsteady. Finally, I examined his arms for recent puncture marks. They were numerous. In the past, I had known Holmes to go on cocaine binges, during which time he would inject himself thrice daily with a 7% solution. Was it possible that in the absence of a challenging case, he had fallen prey to the evils of drug addiction? With this thought, I knocked the ashes from my pipe against the grate, threw an afghan over the inert form of my companion, and turned down the lamp. I left Baker Street and returned to my own residence, where a disagreeable surprise awaited me. There's a gentleman waiting in the consulting room, Doctor. At this hour? What oh, didn't you tell him? I, I tried to, sir. He was most insistent on seeing you, personal-like. This is his card. Professor James Moriarty. Dr. Watson, is it? Professor Moriarty? To what do I owe the honour of this late visit? I apologise for the hour, but I wish to be discreet and my business is urgent. I have come to you, sir, because I know from your published accounts that you are Mr. Sherlock Holmes' most intimate acquaintance. I enjoy that distinction. Then perhaps you can help me to avert a scandal. Doctor, your friend is, well, persecuting me. Persecuting you? I don't know how else to say it. He follows me about London, dogs my steps, waits for me outside the Royal Arts School. I am a teacher of mathematics. Oh, and he sends me threatening telegrams. Look at this. Moriarty, your days are numbered. Moriarty, I am watching you. Dr. Watson, Mr. Holmes is convinced that I am some sort of criminal mastermind of the, of the most depraved order. I know he is a great and good man. All England resounds with his praise. But in my case, he fosters a ghastly delusion. He puts me in a most unfortunate position. The headmaster is becoming suspicious, and I am afraid I will lose my job. I come to you as his friend, rather than turning the matter over to my solicitor. Uh, no, I assure you that will not be necessary. My friend is not well. That is all. Had you known him when he was in full possession of his faculties... Oh, but I did. I knew both boys, Sherlock and his brother Mycroft. I was their tutor at Squire Holmes' estate in Sussex. Brilliant lads they were, the Holmes brothers. I should have liked to go on, only... Then came the tragedy. Tragedy? Now, what tragedy? What do you mean you don't know? I assure you, Holmes has never spoken of his family or his early life. I have met his brother, of course. He lives at his club in Pall Mall, but other than that... Well... If Master Sherlock hasn't told you, then I hardly see that it is my business to disclose Oh, it. you're not leaving, surely. I'm sorry. I cannot and will not be indiscreet in this matter. Really, I must go. I came only to implore your assistance in this most embarrassing predicament. Good evening, Doctor. Oh, good evening, Professor. It was imperative to deal with the situation at once, lest Holmes' mental collapse be made public. I resolved to put into execution a scheme which first occurred to me some months before, when reading a piece by a young Austrian physician in The Lancet. I discussed it with my wife that evening. So, what is to be done? Holmes must be weaned of his cocaine addiction. And there is only one man in Europe who is in a position to help us. The doctor in Vienna who wrote this article. I've cabled him regarding Holmes. And he agrees to help, provided we can get him to Vienna. He will never go to Vienna. You know how he does not like to leave London. He says it generates an unhealthy excitement in the criminal classes when they learn he is abroad. True. We must provide him with an incentive. I ought to be able to think of something, but so far I've failed. John, perhaps we're going about this in the wrong way. I'm doing the best I can. Don't be angry, dearest. I only meant if we wish to outwit Mr. Holmes, we must go to his brother. Mycroft! The very man! <gasps> what a clever thing you are! <laughs> Even Holmes admits Mycroft is his intellectual superior. I shall visit him at once. But you can't be going now. It's after nine. There's no time to be lost. Don't wait up for me. I did not know Mycroft Holmes well, and I remember being astonished when after seven years Holmes informed me of his existence. 
Though equally gifted, Mycroft Holmes was incurably lazy, corpulent, and preferred to live out an eccentric bachelorhood without society of any kind. The Diogenes Club, where he spent most of his time, was devoted to a membership that could not abide clubs. I found him there, and in as few words as possible, I told him of his brother's condition, my worst fears, and the promising article in The Lancet. When I mentioned the visitor to my consulting room, he flushed uncomfortably. Professor Moriarty. He appears to know both of you from the time he tutored. Quite. Quite. And you believe this Viennese doctor can help, my brother? The medical profession is woefully ignorant of the problems of addiction. He appears to have made a study of it. In addition to his other work, hysteria in children. What a peculiar range of interests. Time is of the essence. At the rate your brother is using cocaine, he will be dead within the year. And I have no idea how on earth we are to get him to the doctor in Vienna. We shall provide him with an incentive he cannot resist. A false trail, convincing him that Moriarty has fled to the continent. Uh, do you have Professor Moriarty's address? Here is his card. 114 Monroe Road, Hammersmith. Then we shall have a cab. Jenkins? Stop here, cabby. This is close enough. It would not do to reveal our visit to Sherlock, should he have chosen this night to stand vigil. Look, under the street lamp. Can that be pipe smoke? It is Sherlock. As long as he is watching the professor's door so closely, we cannot hope to enter unobserved. By luck. Oh, wait a minute. There. He's leaving. Quickly. Now, we must accomplish our errand without further delay. Professor Moriarty, may we come in? Uh, um, uh, uh, Dr. Watson? Yes, and this is Mr. Mycroft Holmes. Master Mycroft? Well, uh, why? Pray, do not turn up the gas. My brother may return at any time, and it would not do to let him see any alteration in your room. Well, well what do you want? This is an ungodly hour to come calling. I wish you to take a brief leave of absence from the Royalist School. Huh? No more than three days. <laughs> and journey to the address on this piece of paper. Three days? In memory... Of our past association. This, 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 this is in... I know where it is, my dear sir. And when I arrive... I wish you to disappear completely. Come home and resume your post. Nothing more. Resume my post? If it's still mine. This is really a great deal to ask. I hardly think so. I have no great desire to rake up the past, Professor. But I am perfectly capable of it. Put that way, you leave me little choice. When must I go? Now. But I can't... Time imagine. is essential. But and your flight in the middle of the night will do much to arouse his suspicions. Oh, oh very well, if, if you insist. I'm afraid I do. Oh, but... We left the professor's house and returned in our cab. It's all up to Sherlock now. I wonder if we've made it too hard for him. I think not. From what you've said, his mind is the same instrument it ever was. Only its emphases have been perverted. Moriarty is his man, and he'll find the way to him. I think we need not concern ourselves about that. The rest is up to your Viennese, friend. Good night, Watson. Good night, Mycroft. I made my way to bed and fell into an exhausted sleep following the harrowing events of the day. Early the next morning, however, while at breakfast... Telegram for you, sir. Yeah? Watson, can your practice spare you for a few days? The game is afoot and your assistance would prove invaluable. Bring Toby to 114 Munro Road, Hammersmith. Take precautions. Holmes. Ah. It has begun. Yes, I must bust. Oh, what does he mean by take precautions? He intends me to bring my service revolver. But surely that will not be necessary. I have always followed his instructions to the letter. Ask Cullingworth to take my rounds for me, will you? When will you return? I can't say. I I'm off to fetch Toby now. But who? Who is Toby? Toby is a bloodhound. Readers may recall Toby's remarkable powers from my account of them in The Sign of the Four, in which he was materially responsible for the discovery of the notorious Jonathan Small and his horrible companion. He traced them halfway across London with only a bit of creosote on the bare feet of the latter to guide him. 
Toby lived with his owner, Mr. Sherman the Naturalist, in Lambeth. All right, quiet now, you little blighters. Why, Dr. Watson, uh, bless me, come in, come in. Thank you, my dear fellow. Uh, where did you find the way in this damn fog? <laughs> You'll, uh, you'll be wanting Toby, then. If you wouldn't mind, Mr. Holmes requires his assistance. Just a minute, then, and I'll fetch him. Uh, you've no time for a cup of tea. I'm afraid I haven't. Well, I thought not. <sighs> Always in a hurry, as Mr. Sherlock. Ah! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, oh. now, Toby. <laughs> you just go along with Dr. Watson. Uh, you keep him as long as you need him. Well, goodbye, Toby. There's a good doggy. Uh, give my best to Mr. Sherlock. I will. Uh, come on, boy. <laughs> the road was invisible. Fog, which had gathered at my ankles some hours before, now settled still about me, much higher than my head. All about me was a wall of sulfurous yellow smoke, stinging to the eye and noxious to the lungs. London, in a matter of hours, had been transformed into a creepy dream world, where sound replaced sight. Turning at length into deserted Munro Road, we made for the faint glow of the sole lamp in the street and there stopped. I got out and scanned the vicinity for any sign of Holmes. Hello? 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 Who's that? Why didn't you answer when I called out? I like to stop a song. When I stop a song, they didn't appear me. Um, oh, here you are. I guess, uh, thank you very much. But good heavens, man, how can you ply your trade in this situation? Situations, I... What, what situations, I... This blasted fog. You can't see your hand before you... Oh. Oh, I do beg your pardon. Oh, is that what's doing now? I wondered why it was asked so strange the day. I don't believe I took a shilling all morning. Fog, is it? Eh, hey, must be a regular corker if I haven't had a shilling on account of it. Do you need any help? No, oh, no, oh, bless you, sir, for offering, but I don't. No, no, it's all the same to me, eh? Huh? It's all the same. So, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> Holmes! Holmes! No need to shout, Watson. I'm right here. Oh! Holmes! It was you all along! Just let me get this makeup off. You took me in completely! Oh, forgive me, my dear fellow. You know I can never resist a touch of the dramatic, and the setting was so perfect that I succumbed to temptation. Hello, Toby, old boy. <laughs> Why the disguise? The professor has bolted, Watson. I was keeping watch on his residence last night, and all was quiet until midnight. It was raw and damp, and I went to the public house down the road for some brandy to warm my insides. Whilst I was gone, two men came to see him. <laughs> what they said, I have no way of knowing, but I don't doubt that they were spies in his pay come to tell him of my nets closing upon them. When I returned, they had gone, and the professor as well. How or where, we have yet to discover. I came here, as you saw me, lest his friends should lie in ambush. <laughs> uh, two men, you say? Yeah. Yes. One was tall and quite heavy, 14 stone at least. Uh, this damp ground is very effective for registering impressions. Is it? Uh, the other? Ah, yeah, the other. There are features of interest about him. He was somewhat shorter and not nearly so heavy as his companion, and he walked with a slight limp, <laughs> not unlike yours, Watson, <laughs> in his left leg. <laughs> Mind the vanilla extract! Vanilla extract? Uh, don't worry, my dear fellow. I've not lost my wits. I've taken precautions which will enable me to trace any or all of these men. Look down here and breathe deeply. What in the world? It's better than creosote. If one could arrange it, it isn't sticky, which might warn the wearer that something was adhering to the soles of his boots. It is powerful and long-lasting, and I very much doubt that Toby will be confused by anything remotely similar. Unless, of course, the trail leads us through a kitchen. <laughs> Go on, smell it, boy. Smell it, smell it. 
I poured this here before I left last night. They all trod in it. Moriarty, his two accomplices, and the wheel of the cab that took him away some hours ago. And now? And now Toby will follow the wheel of the cab. At some point, he will exhibit uncertainty, and we will look for the trail to continue on foot. Are we not too late? I think not. The fog that delayed your arrival no doubt interfered with his escape as well. Come on, boy. Come on, Toby. I breathed an inward sigh of relief that I'd changed my footwear, else the sweet substance had led that exemplary canine to me before we'd travelled two yards. The game would have been up before it started. As it was, I was hard-pressed to maintain the cur's pace. Listen. What is it? Victoria Station, precisely what I foresaw. Let us find out how long it has been since the Continental Express has gone and how long before it departs again. And so we took the train to Dover and thence crossed to the continent. Every time the train halted, we provided Toby with a reminder of the vanilla extract from a bottle and proceeded to promenade with him around the station platforms, always without success. Toby, as I had every reason to know, was retaining his character for infallibility. Vienna! Our long journey ended at the Vienna Bahnhof. Incredibly, Toby recovered the scent of vanilla extract and took us directly to the cab rank before the station. It would appear the professor engaged a cab. Cabs that cater to the railway trade invariably return to the terminus after they have delivered their fare. At least that tends to be the case in London. Let us find out if the same rule obtains on the continent. Toby examined each of the cabs without success. However, just as we were ourselves about to commandeer a hansom and go to an hotel... He's found it. Invaluable creature. Cabby, uh, mine hair. Sometime in the last few hours, you picked up a fare at this station, a little man of advancing years, very pale. Ah, uh, yeah. Good. Will you kindly take us to his destination? If I can remember where. Perhaps these Cronin will help you refresh your memory? Yeah, yeah. Now it comes to me. Ah, very fortunate. Come, Toby. In, in, in. Whew. Whew. Just think of it, Watson. Halfway across Europe, we are the last thing he expects. What a confrontation, eh? I think perhaps yeah, I... One, one, one moment, my dear Philip. This is where you brought him? To this house, yeah. Number 19, Bergasse. Very well. Oh, there's something that I should... No, 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 not, not now, Watson. We mustn't disturb Toby's concentration. Well, boy? <laughs> Excellent canine. Ring the bell, Watson. Oh, Holmes, I, I really think that I... Go on, boy. Beard him in his lair. Oh, very well. Yeah, boy. We are here to see Herr Professor Moriarty. Herr Professor? This is Sherlock Holmes. Ah, Herr Holmes. You come in. Und der Hund, ja? Come. We appear to be expected. This way, you come. Uh, I take the dog for you, yes? Uh, give him something to eat. Thank you, I think not. Holmes. Surely no harm will come to Toby. The professor would never dare anything so precipitate. You think not? Oh, very well, perhaps not. But no bones, mind. You understand? No bones. No bones. Yeah. Well, Watson, what do you make of this? I don't know what to make of it. D do you? Good morning, Herr Holmes. And you, Dr. Watson. I'm glad to see you. Come into my study, please. You may remove that ludicrous beard. Can you refrain from employing that ridiculous comic operetta accent? I warn you, you'd best confess, or it will go hard with you, Professor Moriarty. My name is Sigmund Freud. You are not Professor Moriarty? But Moriarty was here. Where is he now? At an hotel, I believe. I see. 
Watson, you have delivered me into the hands of my enemies. I trust they will recompense you for the trouble you took on their behalf. Oh, Holmes. I recognized your footprints outside the professor's home, of course. And I perceived that you brought with you your Gladstone bag, suggesting that you knew we should be going on a journey. I was able to see for myself that you prepared for a voyage precisely as long as the one we undertook. I only wish to know what you plan to do with me now that I am in your power. If you will permit me a word, I believe you are doing your friend a grave injustice here, Holmes. He and your brother paid Professor Moriarty to journey here in the hope that you would follow him to my door. And why did they do that? Because they were certain it was the only way they could induce you to see me. And why were they so eager for that particular event? What reason occurs to you? Who am I that your friends should wish us to meet? Beyond the fact that you are a brilliant Jewish physician who was born in Hungary and studied for a time in Paris, and that some radical theories of yours have alienated the respectable medical community so that you have severed your connections with various hospitals and branches of the medical fraternity. Beyond this, I can deduce little. You are married, you have a young daughter, you enjoy Shakespeare, and possess a sense of honour. But this is wonderful! <laughs> Commonplace. I am still awaiting an explanation. But you must tell me how you guessed the details of my life with such an uncanny accuracy. I never guess. It is an appalling habit, destructive to the logical faculties. A private study is the ideal place for observing facets of a man's character. That the study belongs to you exclusively is evident from the dust. Not even the maid is permitted here. Now, she would scarcely have ventured to let matters come to this pass. Go on. Very well. The nine-branched candelabra on top of your desk confirms my suspicion that you are of the Jewish faith. It is called a menorah, is it not? <laughs> exactly. That you studied medicine in Paris is to be inferred from the great number of medical texts in that language. Where else should a German use French textbooks but in France? And who but a brilliant German could study the complexities of medicine in a foreign tongue? That you are fond of Shakespeare is to be deduced by the book being upside down. The fact that you have not adjusted the volume suggests to my mind that you no doubt intended referring to it again in the near future. That you are a physician is evident when I observe that you maintain a consulting room. Your separation from various societies is indicated by these blank spaces surrounding your diploma, clearly used at one time to display additional certificates. Now, what can it be that forces a man to remove such testimonials to his success? Why, only that he has ceased to affiliate himself with those various societies, hospitals, and so forth. Why? I have no idea. Some position you have taken, evidently a professional one, has discredited you in their eyes. I take the liberty of inferring a theory of some sort, too radical or shocking to gain ready acceptance in current medical thinking. The wedding ring you wear tells me of your marriage. That doll in the corner suggests a daughter. Your balkanized accent hints Hungary or Moravia. Mm -hmm. Have I omitted anything of importance? My sense of honour. It is implied by the fact that you have removed the plaques from societies to which you no longer belong. In the privacy of your study, only you would know the difference. Now I think it is for you to do some explaining. In candour, I ask you again why I have been brought here. You cannot guess. I cannot think. Then it is you, not I, who is being less than candid here, Holmes. For you are suffering an abominable addiction. And you choose to wrong your brother and your friend, who have combined to help you throw off its yoke. You disappoint me, sir. Can you be the man I have come to admire, not merely for his brain, but for his passion for justice? In your heart of hearts, you must acknowledge your illness and your hypocrisy in condemning your staunch friends. I have been guilty of these things. I make no excuse. But as for help, you must put it from your minds, both of you. I have summoned all my will to the task, but it is no use. My feet are on the inexorable path to destruction. A man may sometimes retrace his steps. Not from the fiendish coils of drug addiction. No man can do it. I have. You? I have taken cocaine and am free of its power. It is now my intention to help others. If you will allow me, I will help you. You cannot do this. I can, but it will take time and it will not be pleasant. For the duration I have arranged for both of you to remain here as my guests. Will that be agreeable to you? No use. Even now I am overcome by this hideous compulsion. I will reduce this compulsion for a time. Through hypnosis I will banish your craving when it exerts itself. In this way we shall artificially reduce your addiction until the chemistry of your body completes the process. Now, I want you to keep your eyes fastened upon my pocket watch as it swings. I want you to think of nothing else. In a matter of moments, 
as the detective followed the tiny pendulum, the lids of his usually keen grey eyes assumed a hooded aspect, and finally the pupils themselves rolled upwards in their sockets, and Holmes succumbed to lassitude and slept. Dr. Freud and I managed to carry his emaciated form upstairs. Quickly, we must search all his possessions. Here, four bottles of cocaine in his back. Uh, two in his infamous travelling cloak. Ah, success. Wait, Doctor, we're not dealing with an ordinary patient. I'll empty the Gladstone. Yes, ah, fresh linen. The Times of London. Open to the agony column. What's this? An actor's kit. Grease paint and a false nose. His blind beggar's disguise. Extraordinary man. The bag is completely empty. And yet it is too heavy. Uh, <laughs> a false bottom. Look here. His syringe. Yes. Twenty bottles. His real cash. Ingenious. Come, doctor. We must pour it all down the sink. He pocketed the syringe. And we settled in armchairs in the corner of the room. Schnapps? Ah, thank you. Uh, Prost. Your help. How did you become interested in cocaine? It is a sideline, not directly connected with my researches. A friend of mine died last year of its terrible properties. I was partly responsible. I wrote the paper about it afterwards. That was the piece I chanced upon in the Lancet. You're mainly involved in research, then? Now, I was trained as a neuropathologist with a background in localised diagnosis, but there's no formal designation for what I am now. I started out mapping the nervous system, and now I'm interested in charting the mind itself. I'm interested in an area of the brain I call the unconscious. The un... You are an alienist. <laughs> I use hypnosis to dig into my patients' unconscious minds, where I believe their hysterical symptoms originate. For example, Herr Holmes' dependence on cocaine strikes me as a symptom, an effect rather than a cause. Oh, what makes you say that? Elementary, my dear fellow. Knowing something, as I do, about uh, narcotics and narcotic addiction, I don't believe a man succumbs to their destructive appeal out of mere boredom. Then what on earth? A snake! Oh, a snake, for pity's sake! Holmes! Awake! Do you see it, Watson? Quick! I mean, I'm right in trouble, right in trouble, man! Keep staring at the fangs, the fangs! You don't see me! Watson! Watson is coming! Do you see what? Watson, a swamp out of the deadliest snake in India! Oh, the feet, the snake, the snake in the grass! La, la, la. You had a dream. Oh, a dream. A dream. Yes, stranger. I don't often remember them. But this one you did? Yes. It was about a snake? A snake, a snake, that's right. I, I dreamt about a case I once had occasion to solve, a rather diabolic plot to do away with the young lady. Indeed. But in my dream, the most curious thing, the viper turned into Professor Moriarty. Professor Moriarty? Yes. Do you place much stock in dreams, Doctor? Are they omens which foretell the future? I don't know what dreams tell. <laughs> Lately, I've been toying with you. Oh, do you see it? Do you see it? Calm yourself. Don't get yourself to understand the snake must be... Hold. Let me go, you insufferable cripple. Oh, oh. Uh, Come, uh, you uh, must go uh, back to bed, uh, there, The snake. Come, uh, let me help the you. The snake. Yes, yes, the snake. Oh, yes, oh, now. Oh, yes, the spy. Yes, you must. Yes. He's a spy, for God's sake. He's a spy. Sherlock Holmes' attempt to escape the coils of the cocaine in which he was so deeply enmeshed was perhaps the most harrowing and heroic effort I have ever witnessed. On the fourth day following the onset of his fever and delirium, he awoke, seemingly calm and with a normal temperature. Watson. Watson, is that you? Yes. You are on your way to recovery, my dear fellow. Oh. His pulse is weak, but steady. He appears to have thrown off the addiction. You say we've weaned him from the fiend. Temporarily, but we appear also to have weaned him from his spirit. There is an old proverb that suggests that the cure is sometimes more deadly than the disease. What could we do? Allow him to poison himself? 
No. Herr Holmes, how do you feel? Not well. Do you remember Professor Moriarty? My evil genius. What about him? I know what you want me to say, Doctor. Very well, I shall oblige you. The only time Professor Moriarty truly occupied the role of my evil genius was when it took him three weeks to make clear to me the mysteries of elementary calculus. I am not so much interested in your saying it, but in your understanding it to be true. I understand it. What, Watson? Watson, come closer, old friend. You are my old friend, are you not? You know I am. I do not remember much of the past few hours. Or, or, or was it days? It is over and done with. Do not think about what has happened. It is over. I say I do not remember much, but I do seem to recall screaming at you, shouting terrible things. Did I do that? What's not? Did I just imagine it? You just imagined it, my dear fellow. Because if I did do that, say those things, I want you to know that I did not mean it. Will you forgive me for that monstrous calumny? Will you? Holmes, I beg you. You had best leave now. He will sleep. Holmes' progress over the next few days was minimal. If he took no further interest in the drug, neither did he evince curiosity regarding anything else. He now took his meals with the rest of the household, sitting silent through all the attempts we made at conversation. Following breakfast one morning, Dr. Freud invited us to accompany him to the Malmberg, his exclusive club, for some indoor tennis. I was not surprised when Holmes chose to remain behind. The Malmberg was located south of the Hofburg. Its tennis courts were enclosed in a huge wrought iron structure, rather like a greenhouse. As we entered the dressing room where the doctor kept his tennis costume, we passed a group of young fellows who were drinking beer from some tall tapered glasses, their feet propped up on benches and towels draped carelessly about their necks. As we passed, I heard one of their number, a young man with a sabre scar disfiguring his otherwise handsome if cold features, choke on his drink and laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Juden in the mamba! I say! This place has gone to the dog since last I set foot here. <laughs> <laughs> Were you referring to me? I beg your pardon? It might interest you to know, mein Herr, that since you have last set foot here, which apparently was never, since you appear totally ignorant of the composition of this club, mm -hmm. to say nothing of its manners, the membership has become more than a third Jewish. Uh, Dr. Freud, is it? Uh, not the same Dr. Freud who was asked to leave the staff of the Allgemeines Krankenhaus because of his uh, charming assertions that young men sleep with their mothers. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Doctor, did you sleep with your mother? It was at that point I could no longer restrain myself, and I acted somewhat precipitantly. I seized a beaker of beer from the table and flung it into that insufferable young man's face. Dad! Will you step out, mein Herr? My seconds will call upon you at your convenience. Your quarrel is with me. He merely bore the challenge. I challenged him for myself, Dr. Freud. Doctor, I beg you, let me fight my own battles. Well. At your convenience, Herr Doctor. You know who I am? I do not know who you are. I know what you are. That is enough. And I am the injured party. The choice of weapons is mine, and the time is now. I shall undertake to... Beat you in a set of tennis. <laughs> tennis? <laughs> My choice of weapons. Yes or no? Very well, Herr Doctor. I shall attend you on the courts. <laughs> I shall not keep you waiting. Uh, that man's comments. You don't seriously contend that boys, that they... Well... <laughs> Set your mind at rest, Doctor. I do not contend that at all. <laughs> You do not fear losing the match. My dear doctor, it is only a game. It may have been a game to Freud, but his opponent was in deadly earnest. He was in far better training than the physician. He drove his shots deep and with considerable accuracy. Yeah! Freud answered them as best he could, but appeared in no way discomfited when he was not able to return them. Two games to love. 
During the third game, he did slightly better and reached deuce before surrendering the point. I took it upon myself to draw some water for him as the play was halted for the switching of sides. You did rather better that last round. I hope to do better still. His game is without a backhand. Have you noticed? Every point I've drawn has been to his backhand. Watch! I watched the tide turn slowly but inexorably. Troy took game after game away from the younger man. At first, his opponent could not understand what was happening. It was not until the score was tied at three games that he realized Freud's strategy was deliberate, and knowing his own weakness, stood farther and farther to the left of court in hopes of forestalling the doctor's tactics. But Freud quickly perceived his intentions and frustrated them by shooting his returns down the right-hand alley. And when his opponent did reach them in time, Freud exploited the exposed backhand once more, hitting deftly cross-court again. Anger led the ruffian into errors he should never have made, and Freud drew the set to a close within an hour. Met to Dr. Freud, six times to three. Is honor satisfied? Got in him out. The young man spun on his heels and left the arena. I said nothing of Dr. Freud's encounter at dinner. Holmes remained silent and failed once again to take any interest in either the conversation or his plate. Then, while the maid served coffee, Freud excused himself and returned, carrying a familiar-shaped case. A violin? Not a Stradivarius, I fear. <laughs> it belonged to an uncle of mine. I, I thought you might like to use it while you are here. Thank you. Thank you very much. As I lay in bed that night attempting to sleep, I could hear Holmes quietly scraping away into the wee hours. The music was haunting and desperately sad, but had the eventual effect of lulling me gently to sleep. The episode with the violin proved that his soul was not charred beyond igniting, but whether music was sufficient in itself for the purpose, this I instinctively doubted. The next morning at breakfast, Sherlock Holmes was once more taciturn and morose. Try the schnitzel, Herr Holmes. Oh. See who is at the door, please, Anna. Yes, Mama. Uh, who could that be at this hour? This schnitzel is delicious. Oh, thank you, Herr Doctor. You haven't touched your breakfast there, Holmes. Yes. Oh, see here, Holmes. You must eat. Mm. Mm. There's an orderly from the hospital, Mama. Oh, what can they want? He brought a message for Papa. Let's see. Uh, I would be pleased if you could spare the time to consult with me about a most peculiar case. The patient cannot or will not speak a word. And though she is frail, her health appears perfectly sound. Could you find a moment to stop by and conduct a brief examination? Your methods are a little off the beaten track, but I have always respected them. <laughs> Signed, Schultz. Would you care to accompany me, gentlemen, and see the recalcitrant woman? Come on, Holmes. The fresh air will do you good. Oh, very well. It was no great distance to the hospital, and we hurried there at once, where we were met by Dr. Schultz. She was uh, observed attempting to throw herself into the canal from the Augarten Bridge. Bystanders tried to stop her, but she succeeded in breaking free and throwing herself in any way. The question is, what now? If you can find out who she is or anything of the kind, I shall be forever in your debt. We found a woman sitting in a chair, staring out of wide, unblinking eyes. She was obviously undernourished, and her skin had a delicate blue tint. I should have said she was exhausted had not the rigid quality of her posture proclaimed that she was under the highest tension. There she is. I am due in surgery. Just leave word for me in my office if you will be so kind. I will look in on her again tomorrow. Freud gently held her wrist to gauge her pulse, but when he released his hold, the limb dropped back into her lap like a dead thing. You see... 
They call me only when they don't know what else to do. What made her hysterical? That is not beyond surmise, surely. Poverty, despair, desertion. At the end of her tether, she decides to end her life. And being deprived of that girl, she retreats into the state in which we find her. What will you do? I will see if I can hypnotize her. Uh, keep your eye on my watch as it swings before you. Can you hear me? Yes. Now, you are all right. You will be able to talk and to answer some very simple questions. Are you ready? Yes. What is your name? My name is Nancy. What is your full name? Slater. Nancy Osborne Slater. Von Leinsdorf. All right, Nancy. Tell me, where are you from? Providence. It is the capital of Rhode Island, I believe. The smallest of the United States. And what are you doing in Vienna? <laughs> in an attic. All right, now, relax. You are all right. Doesn't make any sense. Ask her some more questions. Where was she married? Tell me, Nancy, where were you married? In a meat house. A meat house? You say your name is von Leinsdorf. Who is von Leinsdorf? Your husband? Yes. Baron Karl von Leinsdorf? Yes. The Baron is dead. <laughs> no, no, no. All right. Relax. Please relax. Fancy. Mm. Who is Baron Karl von Leinsdorf? An elderly peer of the realm. A cousin to the Emperor, I believe. But he died some weeks ago. I confess I am at a loss. May I pose a question or two? You? If you don't mind. I may be able to shed some small light in the darkness that surrounds us. Uh, it cannot do any harm. I have known my friend make sense out of what was far less sensible. Very well, but be quick. She's exhausted, and I can't keep her in trance much longer. Nancy, there is someone here who would like to talk to you. You may speak as freely to him as you did to me. Are you ready? Yes. Nancy, tell me who bound your wrists and ankles. What? what? I don't know. They used leather, didn't they? Yes. And put you in a garret. What? Uh, an attic. Yes. Tell me, Nancy, how did you escape? How did you leave the attic? I broke the window. With your feet? Oh, how ever did you guess this? <laughs> See, gentlemen, these bluish marks upon the lady's wrists and ankles. Only her own courage and determination enabled her to escape confinement. Note these dried cuts on the back of her feet. She used them without shoes to break a window in her prison and then used the shards of broken glass to free herself from her bonds. A second-story window. How can you know that? Look at the palms of her hands. She lacerated them, sliding down to the ground, probably holding onto a drain pipe. All right, Nancy. Now, sleep. Sleep now. Go to sleep. We left the hospital and shortly afterwards were sitting in a little cafe, pondering the problem of the woman who called herself Nancy Osborne Slater von Leinstorff. What does it all mean? Delaney. We do not know how much of her story is true, but it is certain the lady was bound hand and foot and starved in a garret. Then we are in the presence of some monstrous crime. And to think I was prepared to categorize her as a lunatic that I could not see. You saw, but you did not observe. The distinction is an important one and sometimes makes a critical difference. But who is she? Is she really from Rhode Island? It is a cardinal error to theorize in advance of the facts. Inevitably, it biases the judgment. Shall we inform the police? She was in the hands of the police when she was discovered. If they did nothing for her then, what should they do now? Would you consider looking into the matter yourself? I? But 
Surely my condition... Work is the very thing you need, Holmes. Dr. Watson is right. Work at this point would greatly facilitate your cure. Very well. First, we must find out about Baron von Leinstock, who he was, what he died of, when, and so forth. And, of course, whether or not he possessed a wife, and if so, what nationality. Since our client is unable to answer certain questions, we must work the case from its other end. Is there an Austrian equivalent to Burke's peerage? Perhaps the afternoon would not be wasted if you were to look up some details regarding the late Baron von Leinsdorf. <laughs> Very well. <laughs> a little detective work, yeah? <laughs> I shall enjoy this. <laughs> Good. Then we shall meet at your house shortly. In the meantime, Watson and I will walk back. It will give me time to think. We paid our bill and set forth towards Varingerstrasse. Holmes said little on our way home, though he stopped at a telegraph office and dispatched a wire. The answer to this should tell us something more about our American heiress. When we returned to Bergasse, Dr. Freud was already at home. He reported to Holmes the fruits of his research. Baron Karl Helmut Wolfgang von Leinsdorf was a second cousin to the Emperor Franz Josef on his mother's side. He himself was from Bavaria, not Austria, and the bulk of his estate, which consists of factories devoted to the manufacture of armaments and munitions, is located in the Ruhr Valley of Germany. The Baron has been a pillar, albeit a reclusive one, of Viennese society. He was devoted to the theatre. He had been married twice, first to a lesser Habsburg princess who died some twenty years ago, leaving him with an only son as heir. Young Manfred Gottfried Karl Wolfgang von Leinsdorf enjoys a rather less savoury reputation than his late father. A prodigal, his gaming debts are said to be enormous, and his character, particularly where women are concerned, is known to be totally unscrupulous. He had been to Heidelberg for three years, but left that seat of learning somewhat under a cloud. His political views are said to be extremely conservative. Hmm. And the old Baron's second marriage? Was made two months before his death. On a voyage to America, he made the acquaintance of the Providence textile heiress, Nancy Osborne Slater. They were married almost at once. Why the rush? Surely people of means and station habitually prolong the ritual of betrothal for all the festivity it is worth. The Baron was nearly seventy. Perhaps in view of his death, which occurred so soon after the nuptials, he had an inkling... Quite so, quite so. Mm -hmm. Curiouser and curiouser. They returned to Europe on the Cutter Elysia sometime in mid-March and went straight to the Baron's villa in Bavaria, a virtually inaccessible retreat, I'm told, where the Baron died some three weeks ago. Were you able to determine the cause of death? No, but he was no longer young, as I have said. But in good health? So far as I was able to learn. Hmm. Interesting. But hardly conclusive. After all, when an elderly man, even one enjoying the benefits of good health, takes a wife less than half his age... This speculation is most interesting. However, it is getting late, and we have seats for the opera tonight. Oh, yes, of course. And the great Slezak is singing, is he not? The opera being given that night was something or other of Wagner's, but I cannot remember for the life of me just what it was. I loathed the music with a passion, but Holmes adored Wagner. He said it helped him to introspect. He was utterly enraptured from the moment the music commenced. If any person in that place was more wearied by the opera than I, it was Freud. Some of the stage effects were quite beguiling, a dragon, cleverly simulated by a most complex piece of machinery, appeared at one point, and the great Slezak prepared to slay it. The dragon, however, began to sing, and soon sent Freud off to sleep. It must have had the same effect on me. The next thing I knew, the gas was up, and people were rising from their seats. During the first interval, we sauntered to the vestibule in search of champagne. As we drew near the overhanging boxes of the first tier, Holmes stopped and looked up at them. If Baron von Leinsdorf patronized the theatre, then perhaps he also maintained a box at the opera. Let us make an effort to find out. Holmes, perhaps I can help. Do you see that man with the champagne glass? He is here often, I think. Freud was indicating a very tall gentleman who was heading towards us. Fastidiously dressed, he peered at the world through the thickest lens pince-nez I've ever seen. May I present Hugo von Hofmannsthal? My wife, you know, I believe. Thank you, Frau. And these gentlemen are my guests. 
Herr Holmes and Dr. Watson. Not Herr Sherlock Holmes and Dr. John Watson? This is indeed an honor. No less for ourselves, if we are addressing the author of Gestern. That is my work. And your collaborator is the composer Richard Strauss, is it not? Indeed. I'm very much interested in your work. Oh, and I and yours. <laughs> is it that you are on a case here? Yes and no. Tell me, does the new Baron von Leinsdorf take the same interest in the opera that his father did? It is strange that you should ask. Why strange? Because until tonight, my answer would have been no. I have never known him to take any interest in opera at all. And uh, to be candid, I feared that music in Vienna had lost a powerful benefactor when the old Baron died. Mm. And now? <laughs> and now he comes to the opera. Then he is here tonight? I show him to you. Look at the tears. Uh, there. Third from the left. Doctor. Isn't that... Yes, I believe so. Then you know the Baron? Not before this afternoon. We had occasion to play a set of tennis. Tennis? Who won? Dr. Freud did. The Baron has no backhand. <laughs> <laughs> How unfortunate. That must cramp his style. <laughs> and who is the lady? Ah, uh, that is his stepmother, I believe. The American heiress Nancy Osborne Slater von Leinstorff. Hugo von Hofmannsthal's identification of the woman in Baron von Leinsdorf's box as his widow utterly exploded even Holmes' passion for Wagner. If this were true, then who on earth was our client? Back once more at Bergasse 19, Freud offered us brandy and cigars. Holmes contented himself with his pipe. I'm afraid my grasp of continental politics is not particularly profound. Uh, Dr. Freud, could you assist me? It seems to me quite evident that a European war is brewing. Am I right? A European war? Of monstrous proportions, if I read the signs are right. How can you infer this from what you've seen today? From the rapport between Baroness von Leinsdorf and her stepson. But I did not observe any particular rapport. And that is because there was none. Dr. Freud... Is there an office of registry in Vienna where wills are on fire? Wills? Well, well, yes. Good. Then I should be obliged if you would have the goodness to spend some time there tomorrow morning and tell me who controls the bulk of Baron von Leinsdorf's estate. I have a patient at dead. Dr. Freud, will you believe me when I tell you that not one, but millions of lives are at stake? Very well. I shall do as you ask. And what will you do? With the help of Dr. Watson, I will search for a chink in the armour of our enemies. Can our, can our client travel tomorrow? Gentlemen, do you think? Travel to how far? Only within the city. I should like her to meet someone. I don't see why not. Excellent. Our day has been long, and as the succeeding ones promised to be longer, I think it is time to retire. I, too, was exhausted, but my brain kept racing long after my body was still, trying to piece together the puzzle upon which we had stumbled in the course of our visit to this beautiful yet increasingly sinister city. The next morning, we three shared a hasty breakfast and were about to depart on our several errands when a telegram arrived. It is for you, Herr Holmes. Hmm. Let me see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, no, our plans are unchanged. But... And now, my dear Watson, let us be on our way. We proceeded by Fiac directly to the hospital, where a note in Freud's handwriting secured as the custody of the patient. She was much improved physically, but still spoke not a word. Where are we taking her, Holmes? All in good time, Watson. All in good time. He smiled reassuringly at her client, but she stared straight ahead, her blue-gray eyes vacantly devoid of expression. The fiacre crossed the Danube Canal and entered a section of the city occupied by palatial residences. We stopped at length on Wallensteinstrasse and turned into a wide drive that led to a house situated on a slight rise of ground. A closed carriage stood beneath the porte cochere, and as we handed down our client, the door to the house opened, and out stepped a gentleman of medium height with the straightest back I have ever seen. Though dressed in mufti, his movements bore that unmistakable precision one associates not merely with the military, but with the strictest Prussian training. His face struck me as vaguely familiar. Do you recall having seen that gentleman recently? Yes, but I can't for the life of me think where. Holmes, 
Whose house is this? It is the Vienna residence of Baron von Leinsdorff. Holmes, this is monstrous. Why so? The Baron is not here at the moment. Yeah? I am Sherlock Holmes. Kindly tell the Baroness we are here to see her. And a moment, bitter. But if the Baron should return, you've no idea what harm this confrontation might do to the lady. Surely you ought to have discussed the matter with Doctor. My dear Watson, time is of the essence. And if it is possible, we must force a play. In any event, she does not appear to be reacting to the sight of the house. Who knows? If she does, it may turn out to be just the sort of shock to get her back on her feet. If you will follow me, I shall conduct you to the Baroness. We had need of a guide. The place was so labyrinthine. When we arrived, we found the beautiful woman we had glimpsed the previous evening at the opera. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I believe. To what do I owe that... Good God! Is it Nora? What has happened? She's very changed. You know the lady? I know her. Why, to be sure I know her. This is my personal maid, Nora Simmons. She's been missing for weeks without a trace. Oh, great heavens, Nora. What has happened? And however did you contrive to reach Vienna? I fear you will find her unable to answer your questions. She is in a catatonic state, resulting from the shock of having been abducted and held against her will. But this is monstrous. She was abducted. So it would appear. Do I understand you to say that she accompanied your ladyship to Bavaria? She never left my side from the moment we sailed, except for her days off. It was under those circumstances that she disappeared some three weeks ago. The day of the Baron's death? Why, yes. Nora was not in the villa when the misfortune occurred. She was in the town below us, Ergel's back, I believe it is called. In the confusion, she was not missed. In any case, it was her day off. When she did not return the following morning, I thought that perhaps... Having learned of the tragedy, she had, for some reason, fallen into a panic. Hers was an excitable and nervous disposition, as I had good cause to know. When she failed to return and sent no word of farewell, I began to fear something untoward had occurred and informed the police. You suspected foul play. I did not know what to think. And the police were unable to discover the whereabouts of your maid. They could do nothing. Dear girl... How relieved I am to find you. May one inquire in what manner your husband met his death? His heart. I am sorry to hear it. Well, it appears our business here is finished, Watson. We have solved our little mystery. Madame, we are sorry to have intruded upon your grief and valuable time. But surely you are not taking her from me. I have only just regained her, and I assure you, Mr. Holmes, she is essential to my happiness. In her present condition, she could hardly be of use to you. She needs to be looked after, not to look after others. Oh, but I shall look after her myself. Have I not said that she is my companion as well as my servant? I'm afraid such a solution is quite impossible at present, as your maid is under the care of Dr. Sigmund Freud at the Allgemeines Krankenhaus. But... On the other hand, I... it is just possible that I can persuade the doctor to release the woman into your custody. In Providence, you no doubt involved yourself in church work among the destitute and homeless. I was very active in parish work of that sort. I thought as much. You may rest assured I will communicate that fact to Dr. Freud, and he will no doubt consider it when the time comes to decide upon the proper disposition of his patient. Goodbye. Good day, Mark. <laughs> A very excellent performance, Watson. One in which sheer nerve and ingenuity were matched with the consummate artistry of an Ellen Terry. Of course, they were prepared for this sort of eventuality. The woman has been cleverly coached. She was an imposter, then. This wretched woman here with us is the bona fide Baroness von Leinsdorf, for all the good it will do her. Yet we may, before this business is done, be able to restore some of her rights. Not a sanity. How do you know the other is lying? It may interest you, Watson, to know that the Slaters of Rhode Island have for more than 200 years belonged to the religious sect known as Quakers. The telegram I received confirmed that. Quakers do not attend church. They go to meeting, and they certainly would not refer to charity work as parish work. Oh, and incidentally, I have just recalled where we saw Count von Schlieffen before. Count who? Von Schlieffen, Watson, von Schlieffen, the gentleman who passed us as we came in. His sketch appeared in the Times some months ago. Did you not see it? If my memory serves, he has just been named Chief of the German General Staff. 
That evening, we gathered in the study of Bergasser 19. I believe, Dr. Freud, you're going to tell us that the will leaves everything to the new baroness. <laughs> if you knew the provision of the baron's will, you might have said so. Your morning has not been wasted. Your data have confirmed my suspicions. The time has now arrived to marshal our facts and see if they're covered by our theories. Let me ask you one final question, however, before I pronounce my case complete. What manner of man is Germany's Kaiser? He is bright, apparently, but excitable, given to fits of impatience with those around him. Actually, I have had a theory about the Kaiser for some time now. I shall be most interested in hearing it. You may have known, either from seeing pictures of him or from reading on the subject, that the Kaiser possesses a wizard arm. A withered arm? It has occurred to me that perhaps the Kaiser's insistent emphasis on displays of strength, his love of colourful uniforms, the parade, the medals with which he adorns himself, it, it, it occurred to me that these bellicose loves are all in some way manifestations of his feelings of personal inadequacy. They, they might all be construed as an elaborate compensation for the, the withered arm. This is most remarkable. Do you know what you've done? You've succeeded in taking my methods, observation and inference, and applied them to the inside of a subject's head. <laughs> Scarcely a subject. In any event, your, 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 your methods, as you referred to them, are not covered by a patent, I trust. <laughs> Remarkable. Remarkable. It also conforms to certain facts and theories I shall now lay before you. You know, Doctor, I shouldn't be surprised if your application of my methods proves in the long run far more important than the mechanical uses I make of them. Now then, let me tell you a story. A wealthy widower with an only son he does not care for particularly and who does not care for him goes travelling to the United States. There he meets a young woman half his age, yet in spite of this disparity, or perhaps because of it, they fall in love. Knowing that his own years are numbered, they are married without delay. The woman comes from a well-to-do Quaker background, and the two are joined together in a Quaker church known as a meeting house. This phrase, later mumbled by our client, was understood by us as meat house. Ah. The couple returns to the isolated home of the husband in Bavaria, where the first thing the bridegroom does is to alter his will in favour of his bride. His respect for her religious views on the subject make it impossible for him to retain control of an empire dedicated to the manufacture of war material. Having neither the strength nor the inclination to devote his last years to the dismantling of his factories, he very simply puts the entire matter into her hands in the event of his death to do with as she sees fit. The old gentleman, however, has not reckoned with the wrath of his prodigal son. Finding his hopes cut off, cut off literally from untold millions, this young devil proves capable of drastic steps to regain them. Politically conservative himself and raised in the new Germany, he possesses certain connections and he uses them. Offers are made to certain people, people who have no intention of allowing a foreign commoner to dismantle the core of the Kaiser's war machine. The young man is given carte blanche and is no doubt assigned some help. We have yet to discover how it was managed, but he somehow accomplishes the death of his father. Oh, and then proceeds to spirit his stepmother out of Germany and into a garret near the Danube Canal here in Vienna. The father's will is on file in the two countries where he holds property, and the bride is now urged to sign over her interest to the son. This she courageously refuses to do. But in her lonely confinement, her mind begins to give way. Ingeniously, she manages to escape. When she is free, however, the utter hopelessness of her situation is borne in upon her. The bridge is the nearest and simplest solution, but passing constables prevent it, at which point she retreats into the catatonic state in which we found her. But what of the lady we saw at the opera? And the young man we are playing against is as bold as he is cunning. Upon learning that his stepmother has escaped, he makes a quick decision. He elects to ignore her. Let her tell her story to whoever can understand it. He would not make himself conspicuous by searching for her. He would hire someone to assume her place and bluff through the business of the will with a simple forged signature. For who, when all was said and done, would care to contest the widow's decision? I do not know where he discovered his clever pupil. Possibly she is the very maid she pretended to recognise, or, or else perhaps some American actress down on her luck and stranded far from home. But whoever she is, she has been coached well. Foreseeing the slim possibility that his stepmother would be discovered, he even provided her substitute with that convincing business about the missing maid. The question now... Yo, yo. Papa, this message was uh, brought by an uh, orderly from the hospital. Uh, <laughs> let me see. This is from Dr. Schultz. He wonders what has become of the woman since she had been left in my hands. They've taken her. Fool that I am to have thought they would hesitate whilst I stood babbling here. Fräulein Anna, ask your mother to tell the police to meet us at 76 Valentinsteinstrasse. Hurry, gentlemen, we have not a moment to lose. But we have nothing so much as a deranged woman at one end of our trail. There lurks a European conflagration at the other.
Holmes leapt into his Inverness and raced into the street, Dr. Freud and I hard behind him. We secured a cab and bid the driver hasten with all due speed to the Baron's residence, where we found the Viennese constabulary already in the grounds. Herr Holmes, we have just arrived, but the house is closed and no one appears within. As I surmised, we are too late. This is not a reflection on us, I hope. We got here so soon as we were notified. No, 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 no. The fault is none of yours, though your men have made a fine mess of the ground. Could not be worse if the Lipizzana stallions had performed here. Still, we may as well have a look. Herr Holmes, your reputation is well known to us, and the prefect has ordered me to place my men at your disposal. Really? It's a pity they don't share your prefect's views at the yard. <laughs> Holmes made a hasty examination of the area by the porte cochere. Suddenly, he halted his body quivering over some detail in the ground. There is every indication they have placed the woman inside a large steamer trunk and are carrying her with them out of the country. Where is he taking her? Where? What? Well, right, Bavaria, of course. But last, if he leaves the country with her, we may never see her again. Quick, the station! The startled driver thundered across Vienna and we arrived at the Heiligenstadt Bahnhof some minutes later. Before we had stopped, Holmes was on the ground and racing into the building. When we caught up with him, he was already in excited conversation with the station master. Baron von Leinstorff, of course I remember, but you have missed him. He commissioned a special. He has his own cars, you know. I put together the train myself three hours ago. Baron von München? Yes. We will also commission a special. That one right there, if you don't mind. No, but, no. it takes time to put together a special and money. And we must telegraph ahead to clear the points. Watson? Your revolver, if you please. Where was this train originally headed? This is the Dresden local. It is now the Bavarian Express. You will be kind enough to accompany us. But, no, we haven't enough fuel for München. And the points, the points are all wrong. We will cross the first obstacle when necessity compels us to. And as for the second, we will switch the points as we go. I never get your limits, Watson. Off we go, then. Full speed, mind. This is railway property. You cannot... The Baron has abducted an American lady. Who the devil are you? My name is Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock? We must pack the furnace with coal. Engineer, pour on all speed. It was a sight I shall not soon forget. The world's greatest detective and the founding father of that branch of medicine known today as psychoanalysis, side by side, in their shirt sleeves, piling coal into that boiler as though it was work for which they'd been born. How much fuel have we left? If we make it to Steyr, we'll be lucky. What else will we burn? There is nothing else, I'm afraid. Then we are lost. I'm sorry, Herr Holmes. Wait, the one car we're pulling, is made of wood? Yes, but... It is railway property. We will take the responsibility. But you cannot reach it without climbing over coppings. And at this speed... Watson, hand me an axe. Be careful, Holmes. We took apart that unfortunate car and burned it piece by piece. As we tore through the night on our mad chase, that car disappeared entirely under our ministration, and our speed did not slacken. By dawn's light, the city of Steyr was in plain view when shouts from the engineer and station master drew us to the front of the demolished car. Wonder of wonders. Not three miles off, a train was heading southwest with an engine, a tender, and three cars in tow. There they are! There go, you are a genius. Now we must pour on every ounce of steam we can. We must catch them before they cross the frontier. We did as Holmes bid and rushed frantically about, heaping the boiler fires higher and whiter than ever with the frag of that once proud railway carriage. The city of Steyr whipped past at a dizzying speed. Once through the station, it was only a matter of moments before the Baron's train reached the Danube. Oblivious to everything now, we scuttled the remains of that car faster than one would have supposed possible. They turned the barriers! Round them! The Baron! Down! Bergam, how can we put on more speed? Release the platform! We climbed through the empty tender and stood over the naked couplings, the ground rushing by below us at a fearful rate. 
Holmes straddled the huge iron claws while I got on my stomach and held him firmly around the waist. He threw off the heavy emergency links and then proceeded to undo the revolving bolts. There was a sudden release and a great burst of speed. Had I not been holding fast, Holmes would have toppled to an instant death. Never let them say you were merely my Boswell, Watson. Never let them say that. We have burned every scrap of available material. We have released the iron wheels of our only carriage. There is nothing further to be done. If we do not now close in on that train, all our efforts have been in vain. The needle on the pressure gauge is dropping. We have lost him. Look ahead. Where? Holmes, he has released one of his cars. Break! I felt our wheels freeze beneath us and saw sparks fly in every direction from the rails as we struggled to avoid a collision. Everyone braced for the shock, but at the last moment we realized that we were not going to strike. After all, the vehicle was obeying the laws of momentum and was now traveling ahead of us through the mountains at a good clip. Holmes, perceiving the situation, threw off his Inverness and started round the camp towards the front of the locomotive. He has made a fatal mistake. Keep a close bag up and put on every ounce you can. Watson, I'll trouble you for your service revolver. What will you do? What I can. Holmes. Watson, old man, if anything happens, you will think kindly of me, I trust. Is this necessary? I did not save your life to assist you in throwing it away again. I can think of nothing else. Goodbye, Freud. And may God bless you for saving my life and for the services you will yet render mankind. Bag up. Keep her close. Holmes climbed along the outside of the engine towards the car we were pushing before us as the Baron's train drew nearer and nearer still. In an instant, he made his way into the empty carriage. As we wound among those stupendous mountains, Berger imitated precisely the openings and closings of the other engine's throttle. Timmy! Pistol shots! Look! Someone is climbing onto the roof of the car! It's the Baron! Off of my revolver! Where is Holmes? There! Climbing after him! It was Sherlock Holmes. And like the Baron, he carried a revolver and a saber. Though how these weapons chanced to be aboard the train, I did not learn until afterwards. The two men faced each other at opposite ends of the trembling car. The Baron whipped round his revolver and fired. The shot went wide. He tried again as Holmes inched forward. But the gun had jammed. With a furious gesture, he hurled it aside. In automatic response, Holmes brought up his own weapon and aimed it. Shoot, Holmes! Shoot! If he heard as he gave no sign, nor did he pay any heed when we tried to warn him of the approaching tunnel. But at the last minute, he divined the danger and flattened himself to the roof, the pistol flying from his hand as he did so. When we again burst into the daylight, we discerned the combatants with swords in their hands. If you want the woman, you'll have to fight for her. It will be my honor, Alan. In an instant, they grappled, and their blades crossed, flashing in the clear sunlight. Back and forth, they slashed and thrust, struggling to maintain their footing as they fought. Neither was an amateur. Truth forces me to confess, however, that the Baron was home superior with the saber. He pressed him slowly, relentlessly back to the end of the car, his satanic features grinning with anticipation as he perceived his advantage. Then Freud shouted into the wind, Holmes! No backhand! No! Holmes thrust to the Baron's backhand. He parried clumsily, and Holmes impaled him. The Baron drew back with such force that the saber hilt was wrenched from my friend's hand. The Baron stood for a moment on the carriage roof, swaying, his evil face immobile with shock. And then with an awful cry, he plunged over the side. At once, Holmes climbed to the end of the car and descended onto the platform between carriages. Freud and I followed by crossing through the car. On its walls were armorial mementos, and it was from one of these gilded crests that Holmes and the Baron had seized their weapons. In desperate haste, we began our search amongst innumerable trunks and portmanteau. Look for air holes. Here! Holmes seized the sword and slid its blade behind the lock of an enormous trunk. With a mighty effort, he tore loose the catch 
and he and I together threw back the clasps and forced the thing open on its massive hinges and there alive unharmed and in much the same condition as we had left her her blue gray eyes open but unseeing sat Nancy Osborne Slater von Leinsdorf is she all right she will be and now let us stop these trains The next night, we were once again settled in Freud's study. No, we've not really prevented a war. The most we can be said to have done is to have postponed it. But... No, it's no secret that fleets are building up at Scarpa Flow, and if the Kaiser wishes to go to war with Russia over the Balkans, he will find the means to do so. With the Baron dead and the Baroness incapable, it would not astonish me to learn that the German government has declared the will null and the estates intested. At that time, you and I, Dr. Freud, may find ourselves on opposing sides. I cannot doubt the truth of your prophecy. Perhaps all our labors have failed nothing. Oh, I should not go quite that far. We have, after all, gained time. You recall Marvell's choice phrase, Watson, had we but world enough and time. Mm. Well, what the world needs desperately is time. If our work has gained but an hour more in which to understand the human predicament, it shall not have been in vain. There are other benefits of a more immediate nature to show for our work. For one thing, we've rescued that unfortunate woman from a fate worse than death. And for another... And for another, Dr. Freud has saved my life. Oh. Your hypnotic therapy has rescued me from a terrible addiction, and beyond that, your judgment has saved my life. Oh. Your judgment and, and Watson's here. For him, there will be a lifetime to repay the dead. What can I do for you? i tell you what I should like. Let me hypnotize you once more before you leave. But I tell you, I'm cured. It has been observed that the proper study of mankind is man. I thought you might permit me to peer once more into your brain. There is another part of your mind to which I would also like to say farewell. If you insist. Elves, keep your eye on my watch, please. Now, listen carefully to my voice. I'm going to ask you some questions, and you will answer them. When you're finished, I will snap my fingers, and you will awaken. When you do, you will remember nothing that has taken place while you were asleep. Do you understand? Perfectly. Very well. When did you first use cocaine? When I was 20. Where? University. Why? I was unhappy. Why did you become a detective? To punish the wicked and see justice done. Have you ever known wickedness personally? Yes. What was that wickedness? My mother deceived my father. She had a lover? Yes. What was the injustice? Mother, mother. What is it? What do you remember? My father killed her. Your... Your father murdered your mother? Yes. And the lover, what became of him? She fled. Who was he? Who was he? My tutor. Your... Professor Moriarty? Oh, yes. Professor Moriarty. All right. Sleep now. Sleep. I will awaken you shortly, and you'll remember nothing of this interview. Do you understand? Nothing. I understand. Good, good. Sleep now. The Napoleon of crime. What? Holmes was right about him from the very beginning. Professor Moriarty, I mean. It all becomes clear now. As he himself would observe, see how much is explained by these facts. We understand not only the origins of his addiction and his hatred of Professor Moriarty, but also his distrust of women. So well recorded by you, Doctor. And also his choice of profession. Detector of wickedness, punisher of injustice. It also explains Mycroft Holmes' hold over Moriarty and his own eccentric behavior. Shut up in that club for an eternal bachelorhood. You are the greatest detective of them all. <laughs> I am a physician whose province is the troubled mind. 
which means in this case simply that I have borrowed some of your friend's methods and applied them to himself. You will recall, Doctor, that we spoke of an area of the mind I called the unconscious. Well, he has led me to it, given me the clues himself. But how? I will confine myself to an observation made by your English playwright, the one he deduced I am so fond of reading. <laughs> we are such stuff as dreams are made on. Take heart. Your friend is a functioning human being. Within the framework of his unhappiness, he is nevertheless successful and even beloved. Wake up, Herr Holmes. Ah. Did I tell you anything of importance? It was not very interesting, I'm afraid. <laughs> now we must hurry. Your train leaves within the hour, and my wife would like to say goodbye. You have made a conquest. My daughter wishes to study the violin. I hope you'll keep this one, by the way. As a souvenir. We left Vienna after a tearful goodbye with Frau Freud, little Anna Freud, and the maid who had been so kind during Holmes' convalescence. Holmes carried Sigmund Freud's violin. I often thought during those dark years that opened this century of Sigmund Freud's brief interior profile of the Kaiser based on the observation of his withered arm. Though whether he was right or wrong in his conclusions, I cannot say. I was sufficiently distracted en route to be astonished when our cab came to a stop. Holmes, this is a steamship, not a train. As always, Watson, little escapes your keen powers of observation. We are on a key abutting the Danube. We're going back to London. You are, my dear fellow. I'm not. I need some time to myself, Watson. A little holiday. Holmes, I don't like this at all. When will you return? One day. In the meantime, inform my brother of my decision and tell Mrs. Hudson my rooms are not to be touched. Is that clear? But... Uh, rest assured, my dear fellow, it's only that I must complete my recovery. Give my best to Mrs. Watson. But how will you live? You would do well to follow the concert career of a violinist named Seegerson. But your readers, uh, my readers, what will I tell them? Anything you like. I know. Tell them. I watched while the boat pulled away from the pier and steamed up the Danube. I stood for no little while on the dock, wondering when I would next see my friend. My own return trip to England was uneventful. I slept most of the way, the faithful Toby by my side. And when I stepped onto the platform at Victoria, there was my old dear girl waiting for me with a wide smile and open arms. And it will surprise no one to learn that when it came time to write down what had occurred, I followed Sherlock Holmes' advice to the letter. Tell them I was murdered by my mathematics tutor. They'll never believe you in any case. The part of Sherlock Holmes was played by Simon Callow. Dr. Watson, Ian Hogg, Sigmund Freud, Carl Johnson. Professor Moriarty and Dr. Schultz, David King. Mycroft and Berger, Philip Voss. Baron von Leinsdorf, Matthew Morgan. Nancy Osborne Slater von Leinsdorf, Melinda Walker. The bogus Baroness von Leinsdorf, Geraldine Fitzgerald. Hugo von Hoffmannsthal, Wolf Kehler. With David Bannerman, Kate Binchy, Federe Holmes, Jilly Mears, and David Sinclair. Music by David Chilton and Nicholas Russell Pavia. And the violin played by Steve Bentley. Technical presentation by Carol McShane, Rosamond Mason, and Anne Bunting. The 7% Solution was adapted by Denny Martin Flynn from the novel by Nicholas Meyer and directed by Jane Morgan. <laughs>